welcome to our Thursdays with Noma. Um, before we begin tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce Noma's art stroke coordinator, Martin Collins, who has a special statement to share with all of us tonight. Martin. Good evening, Naria, Michelle, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for joining us on Thursdays with Noma. A robust turnout as we uh, launch this uh, evening with uh, Sky Pape, which is sponsored by Grandpa's Brick Oven Pizza, located at 4973 Broadway at Isham Street. Grandpa's Brick Oven Pizza is a 20-year-old Inwood eatery serving delicious brick oven pies, slices, Italian subs, pastas, salads, and more. Go to mygrandpaspizza.com. That's mygrandpaspizza.com to see their full menu. Dine in, take out, delivery, order through all of the delivery apps. They're open seven days a week from 11 a.m. to 10 p.m., and they are a proud supporter of this year's Uptown Art Stroll and our thanks to Grandpa's Brick Oven Pizza for sponsoring Thursdays with Noma and Sky Pape. Miriam, back to you. Thank you so much, Martin, and thank you, Grandpa's Pizza, for your support. Good evening to all of you. It is so wonderful to see all of you here tonight. My name is Neria Leva Gutierrez, and I am the Executive Director of the Northern Manhattan Arts Alliance. Thank you for being here, for supporting us, and for helping us honor and celebrate our incredible artists. It is always a joy to be in cultural communion with all of you on Thursday evenings, especially on a rainy one like uh, tonight. And I'd also like to thank the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs for supporting this program. And for those of you who joined us week after week, or if you've come on one time, or this is your first time, this program is an opportunity to get to know our amazing Uptown artists. It's an opportunity to learn something new or unexpected about these artists. And it's especially a chance for all of you to ask questions and engage in conversation with our featured artists. So please, as always, we encourage you to ask questions in the chat to give you a chance to ask them directly. I am so thrilled to welcome our guest tonight, Sky Pape. Born in Canada, Sky has lived in Inwood for 20 years and has been a part of Noma's creative family since its origin. Indeed, she is a past Noma honoree, has earned several Noma grants, exhibited her works in multiple Noma exhibitions, including the recent In Out Light Dark Women in the Heights and Art in Our Time, curated by Andrea Arroyo, and her studio has always been a popular destination spot on the Uptown Arts Swirl. Sky is prolific. She and her CV is as impressive as it is extensive. A graduate of Parsons School of Design since the 1980s, she has exhibited her work in the United States and abroad in both solo shows, including an upcoming September show at the June Kelly Gallery in New York entitled Anomalies and in countless group exhibitions all over the United States and Canada. Her work can be found in both national and international collections, corporate and public collections, including the Arkansas Museum of Fine Arts, the Sheldon Museum of Art, the Grand Rapids Art Museum, the Brooklyn Museum of Art, the Guggenheim, MoMA, and the National Museum of Women in the Arts in Washington, D.C., to name just a handful. She has also been awarded numerous grants and prizes dating back to the late 1980s from the Pollock Krasner Foundation, the Boldiasco Foundation in Italy, the Metropolitan Transit Authority, and the Rockefeller Foundation's Bellagio Center, also in Italy. Most recently, she was awarded a City Artist Corps grant from the New York Foundation for the Arts and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. And these are only a few of the many awards and honors she has earned. She has been featured in numerous publications such as Art News and the New York Times and in many catalogs. And she has participated in multiple conferences and lectures. She has also published in the Journal of Cognitive Neuroscience. Indeed, up until 2000, Sky maintained a parallel career in scientific research, primarily in the fields of schizophrenia, genetics, and traumatic brain injury. According to Sky, she possesses a researcher's heart and mind, infinitely interested in the intersections between art, science, and the mathematical disciplines. She is interested in, quote, the state of not knowing and staying in that space long enough to see different answers instead of grasping at the first one. It is this curiosity that informs her work, where she engages in questions of connectivity, 
resilience, continuity, uncertainty, the intersection of chance and choice. Engaging and dialoguing with mystery, she is inspired by nature, philosophy, politics, literature, and poetry. Her interdisciplinary approach to her work shows up in her process, where she tirelessly experiments with traditional materials, graphite, ink, water, and paper, alongside the non-traditional, the shoeing a brush, for example, all the while challenging the boundaries of space in her complex compositions. A self-described seed sower and pom-pom waver for creatives of all types, Sky is also an avid naturalist and is actively involved with local oyster restoration, living shoreline, and other environmental initiatives. According to Sky, living and working in New York and being part of a vibrant community of artists who are supportive and generous, success is to be part of that accessibility, living a creative life and sharing art and knowledge to shine a light on that path for those coming up. And here to continue shining light is Sky Pape. Sky. Wow, Miria, thank you for such a beautiful introduction. And Noma, thank you for hosting this tonight. I just want to say um, bienvenidos a la fiesta, everybody. Welcome to this party. Thank you for being here. And uh, I think we, since I can't let you into my real studio now, we have a little video that we're going to show that gives you a little glimpse of the studio and some thoughts. And uh, then we'll get, get back to talking. Hi, I'm Sky Pape, and uh, I just found out I'm supposed to do a video for this event. So instead of talking to myself, I'm going to talk to this here big plant and uh, if we both make it through to the end we'll consider it a success. Um, what better to hide the embarrassing bits than a nice fig leaf, right? So normally this time of year I'd get to welcome you all to my studio as part of um, the Uptown Art Stroll Open Studios which we've been doing for years and years now um, and I've been part of it for almost every year I think. But anyhow here we are virtually and uh, this is my little space so if you visited my studio or i was welcoming you here now one thing you'd see is this piece here from my silver lining series and uh, this piece is a two-dimensional piece from about 2001 called the truths and lies of friendship and it's graphite and milk paint on board um, and you've got this kind of continuous knot shape in there that resurfaces in more recent work and um, if you come up really close you can see the hand made marks going on there um, which is me laying down layers and layers of graphite pressing as hard as I can until it builds up to that surface sheen that you see there. So hanging up over here is another graphite piece also from um, over 20 years ago. This is graphite on paper cut and folded paper. It's got a little bit of a 3D thing going on there. Um, and it also shifts and changes depending on the angle and the light. Um, and below it um, is a little piece that it doesn't really belong to any series. It's part of the nice thing about coming to an open studio is you see these sort of tangential pieces um, that are really singular and probably don't get shown because they're not part of anything bigger series. Um, this is uh, Japanese sumi ink on Okawara paper and with Sekishu paper and stones. And it's just a little piece that's um, traveled with me, sort of like a talisman from studio to studio, hanging out there. Um, 
And over here is a more, much more recent piece called Catch and Release, which is ink, uh, ink and paint on paper. And you, it's interesting for me to see the relationship between work that was going on over 20 years ago and something like this um, piece here. And if I get in close to, ignore the shadow, um, you can see, you can start to see how handmade these things are, that they, they are definitely not about being perfect. While we're here and I'm talking a bit about process, I had mentioned that I always work on the floor and sometimes I work really big even though I don't have a whole lot of floor space, which is normally never this clean. Um, but I do maximize the space that I have. Um, it reminds me of a story of the artist Morris Lewis, who worked in his very tiny dining room as a studio, and he worked on these incredible large canvases that he had rolled up part of the time, so he couldn't see the whole thing that he was working on um, because he didn't have space to unfurl it all at once, and uh, it didn't stop him from making some seriously great work. That is my studio assistant um, taking a break but normally she's very helpful. This piece, which is 80 inches by 60 inches, is one of the large pieces I made on the studio floor. It's about 15 years old, called Plexus from my Drawing Breath series, where I was breathing ink, blowing ink through straws and tubes, and then cutting around the lines that I'd make so they'd, they become sort of 3D and you can see these shadows that are cast actually become very intentionally part of the piece. And the lines look like various different kinds of systems to me, um, neural networks, synapses, the airways in my own lungs that I was using to make them, the pieces, um, networks of tree roots or waterways. Um, it's fascinating to me all the different kinds of connections that surface. One thing I learned was that if I was going to be making art and putting it out into the world, I needed to be able to deal with rejection and have a thick skin. Anything I apply for, there's not just 10 or 20 people going for the same thing. There's hundreds or even thousands. So um, I got this little rejection jar and I put a five, five dollar bill in it every time I get a rejection with the idea that at the end of the year, I get to treat myself to something nice for my efforts. Um, I learned that I don't have to wait until the end of the year and I got this fig dipping in early with the idea that it's gonna produce some fruit and I will enjoy the sweet fruit of my efforts even if they didn't always produce the results that I would wish for. Um, the other one I have here is Goody's Jar, and in that one, I just, anytime any little thing happens that's nice or good during the year, I put it in there, and at the end of the year, I review all those sweet things, um, and it helps keep it going, uh, a lot of those nice little things that you might forget. Well, here we are again, both still alive. Um, you know, making this video was scary for me, but you know, making art or talking about art can be really scary too, but so, so worth it. Um, you know, uh, creativity 
is a way of being and it's one of the greatest gifts about being a human being. Um, and I don't just mean that for artists. Um, you know, art can be disturbing and joyful and enlightening and all of these things. Um, it's, it's an invitation and an opening uh, for learning about something, for thought, for navigating this crazy existence. And um, when I work and make something um, or look at something, I ask questions of it and I ask questions of myself and I'd really encourage you to do the same, you know, see where it takes you. So thank you for loving art and being interested enough in it to come and join me for this. Um, it means so much and I hope in the future I can open my doors and invite you, welcome you for a real in-person open studio again. I love that. Be well and please do reach out. I love to hear from you. I, I love that video. <laughs> I just, I love the video. I love, I mean, first of all, I love your special guests, right? The dog, the fig uh, plant. I mean, and, and I love, um, I feel like everyone should have a rejection jar, just sort of, you know, for whatever you're doing in your life. Every, I think we all need a rejection jar. What a, what a fantastic um, idea. I love that. Um, I just want to thank um, Felicia Van Bork, if she's out there, an artist who suggested that to me. And somebody else, I think that needs to morph maybe into the, um, the submissions jar so that I get a reward rather than just the rejections. I should, you know, there's something really positive of getting the reward just for putting it out there, no matter what the result is. Well, I think, but I think that's also, I, I, you know, hearing you say that, I mean, in a way, that's the light motif in, in your work, in your process, you know, sort of putting it out there. Your, your work um, invites so much intimacy. You know, there's something about your work that just calls people to look, to engage, you know, um, and and it's it's such a part of of your process. I mean, even that idea, right, of sort of making connections and and asking questions of, you know, the art and the art is sort of, you know, demanding questions of the viewer. I mean, that that is that whole process, right? Is 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 a process of, of sort of creating intimacy in in a, in a way, right? And dialogue, um, and I think I think you also. I mean, because one of the things you know, again, we can't be you know in your studio live, um, and there's so much precision in your work, and there's so much you know um, detail and complexity. And I know that you have some stills. Um, and I'd love to hear a little bit more about these, like looking close up at some of these details. If you could take us through these, that would be, I think, really great for all of us. Uh, I would love to blow through a bunch of these images here. Um, I'm just going to say, you know, in the in the 60s, Susan Sontag wrote against interpretation, and she she said something like. Um, interpretation is the intellect's revenge against the art. So I'm just going to say the work you're going to see, you know, this is an invitation to be with whatever thoughts it might spark in you. You know, once the work is out into the world, it's really, you know, it's its own thing and it's about what you or anybody else bring to it. So now you are totally, totally off the hook and you can just look at the pictures and you can mute me and don't have to pay attention to anything else that I say tonight. But uh, here we go, blowing through some pictures. This is one I sent out. Um, some of you have seen this and a little announcement I sent out about this event. And it's a piece from my Anomalies series that's part of the show that will be coming up in the fall. And you know, this is just, you're looking at this piece and you can see like, it feels like there's a system, there's something organized going on there. Um, and it looks really ordered, but if you look, if you started to look at it longer, you'd start to see that it's really chock full of all sorts of irregularities and, um, and it's a pretty funky system if it's a system at all. Um, you wanna go in the next one, Michelle? Uh, 
this is from the same system. It's called Mystery Date. And, um, you know, it just to me, aside again with these patterns and things, it, it also just speaks to my interest in engaging with mystery. Um, the title also references a practice I adopted from a friend who might be here tonight, David Banyan, if you're out there, where uh, one person makes all arrangements for a date and then just tells the other person when and where to show up and maybe what to wear or something. And it's all about like being game and trusting the uncertainty of being in someone else's hands, um, you know, not knowing what will unfold. That also involves trusting yourself that you're resilient enough to deal with what's going to unfold in front of you. And um, that's about, uh, maybe we'll move on to the next one. Um, this one's called The Most Unaccountable Machinery, which um, the title came from something, a quote from Virginia Woolf, who said, um, my own brain is to me the most unaccountable of machinery, always buzzing, humming, soaring, roaring, diving, and then buried in mud. And why? What's this passion for? And I, I really love that. Um, I think there's a detail of this piece from the bottom of it. And uh, Michelle, uh, yeah, which sort of has these funny little eyeballs in there. And you know, that's sort of a common thing when you get to see my work in person. There are all these little hidden details. And if you see like old Dutch or Flemish still lives or something, there's often, sometimes the artist makes a self portrait in the, in a reflection on a piece of silver, a silver pitcher or something. And all of these little details I throw in there, like notes to myself, you know, they're little self portraits, they're breadcrumbs, they're rewards for like closer and repeated looking that I like to put in there. Um, you want to go to the next one? Whoops. Um, okay, that one is called uh, M's Kitchen Table. And M, I have an aunt M. I don't know if she's here tonight, but um, the M in this one is for different Marjorie, Marjorie Rice, um, who was a San Diego homemaker who only had about one year in math school. And she read a Scientific American article in 1975 that was talking about all the possible ways to create endless patterns using pentagons. And the article said every single pattern had been discovered. And Marjorie Rice was there like on her ironing board or in her kitchen, ta you know, at her kitchen table doodling away. And she was like, I don't know, I really like love this puzzle. I really want to figure this out. And she, much to their surprise, this, you know, housewife um, discovered four new possible patterns and pentagon. So I was really sort of inspired by that. Um, the next one is called Happy Hour. And that's an early example from the Anomaly series. And again, it's referencing connections people make and ways we communicate. If you will go to the detail of that one um, below. You know, these little tear off tabs, which we've always seen found on the streets, you know, having to do with ways that we connect in the physical world. And there are little things like words hidden in there and stuff like that. Um, the next one is called Cell Nav, which is uh, the title for that. Cell Nav is the short, um, short form for celestial navigation. And uh, I was interested by traditional system, systems of navigating through the world. Um, you know, celestial navigation was used by, I'd say, like at least three famous magi some um, 2,000 years ago. And uh, I it came into my consciousness I was talking about with, um, with my nephews in the Navy, and they still teach it in the Navy. So take that GPS. Um, that next one there is called Triangulating Peace. And this piece was, that idea was based on um, theories of Immanuel Kant, the philosopher, about interna international relations. And um, the idea behind it is that chance, the chances of war can be greatly reduced when um, the three elements of democracy and um, economic interdependence and international mediation are simultaneously in play between different nations. Um, 
The next one, which these are all through like my time being and passing through series was called Day Into Night. And this one too has elements that suggest transition. And at the same time, the interlocking infinity signs um, imply connection and continuity. Um, after that, <clears throat> this is a piece that I called Emissary um, that was made around the time of the Parkland shootings in Florida, um, which took that, that was the one that took the lives of 17 young people. Um, if you look at the detail of that, there's some stuff that I've written in there. I don't know if you can see it sort of in that edges of the triangle and the diamond shape, there's some writing and the names of Emma Gonzalez, who is a Parkland student, Emma Lazarus, who you'll know from the Statue of Liberty, and Emma Goldman, who was an important political activist, are kind of all in there as emissaries, as people who bring about um, change. Emma Goldman said, uh, the most violent element in society is ignorance. And I think that's a, still a pretty good one to sit with right there. Um, the one after that, the, the next two, this one and the one coming up, um, are from a series I did when I was in residency in, in Bellagio, Italy, for, from the Rockefeller Foundation. And these show a lot of the work I do uses traditional materials like paper and water and ink in untraditional ways. And these were made part of a series that used water and its different forms of mist and ice and rain and even snow. And when I was looking at this one, I thought, oh, you know, this reminds me of all the fireworks that have been going off in our neighborhood. And <laughs> if you're in Inwood or Washington Heights, you know what I mean. Uh, and the way it sort of describes these patterns of dispersion um, was really interesting to me. And it's also sort of talks to how our perception works that these things suggest things in the real world like landscapes or whatever, but those things are not there at all really in the work. So our, our mind is kind, our minds are kind of hardwired to see these things. So it's pretty interesting the way our, our brains just sort of jump to conclusions. Um, you wanna to go to the next one? Uh, this one and the next two images this one's called Ripple. It's really big, made on handmade paper by one of the paper makers who is a um, national cultural treasure of Japan. Um, and it's more examples of sidestepping traditional tools. Each mark on this piece is, um, is an ink bubble made by blowing through tubes or funnels. So um, again, just work of my breath control, making these pieces, um, a lot of patience. Uh, you want to go to the next one? This is called Fathom. Uh, similar, this is the same kind of technique. And the next one is a detail of that piece, Fathom, so you can see a little more closely all the kind of swirls and weird marks um, that show up in those. And I'm going to wind up here again with another one of these silver lining pieces that you saw in the video. Uh, again, I, I'm always interested in trying to push the boundaries of traditional tools. In this case, it's the graphite, but um, also engaging again with themes of connectivity and entanglement. And this one sort of riffs on the, the yin yang symbol. And um, and that's the end of the show. I wanted to give you a real variety pack because when you see a, a solo show in the city, it always tends to be most recent work or whatever. And it's um, nice to see things from, from different bodies of work and, and get an idea of the variety. Thank you. That was so great. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, I'm, I love, um, you know, the, the, the juxtaposition um, sort of between the sort of the patterns of dispersion as you talk about, you know, in some cases, and then the tightness of other of, of, of your work, you know, there's this kind of looking inward and there's sort of this, you know, you sort of almost feel like a nucleus somewhere that you are kind of looking towards.
and then the dispersion, you know, I, I, I like that kind of that, that contrast, right? Um, and I think you talk a little bit about that, sort of that um, uncertainty or the ambiguity of space and, and, and connections and um, mystery, which is something that you talk quite a lot about. Can you expand a little bit on about on that? I, and I and I say that knowing um, full well, and this is something I also want you to talk about. Although we have several questions, I also want to get to those um, about also your your background. You know, your your sort of um, your engagement with 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 geometry, right, and and math um, and sciences, and sort of you know the, your other kind of parallel interests um, in, in sciences. How do all of those um, intersections kind of make their way into your into your work. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? That's a what's the question? That's a very <laughs> that's a very big <laughs> yeah, I, I want to I, I think I think a little bit, you know, and I, I guess it goes back to the, the, the concept of mystery. I mean you, you sort of bring that up quite a lot, right? Sort of Yeah. Well I think mystery for me is like looking at something and just like going wow wow what is this what is this and staying within and then one question leads to another and and you know maybe that's the researcher's heart and mind of probing these things and sort of diving in and how do you how do you get more information about it so that's why you know for me the work is really um a process and i'm not the kind of artist who figures it all you know has an idea and then just goes and and go, then goes and like executes the vision exactly as it's as it's in my head because it's more about like feeling my way and finding seeing what I can find out along the way, which often involves like a lot of mistakes, a lot of messes, a lot of this. A lot of, but you know, it's um, that's how that's how I learn, and um, and also I learn by like I think all of these different disciplines. You know, that's why in school you need art, you need mathematics, you know, you need all these things because they all feed each other. They all feed how we think maximally using our minds to the best of our ability. So um, I'm very much into the benefits of uh, cross-disciplinary dialogue, interdisciplinary um, interdisciplinary work and bringing all of that stuff, whatever is at hand, into feeds feeds me. You know. No, that that that's, that's absolutely true, and I and I and I think it's that um, you know interdisciplinary approach um, that you have, right? That that also leads to um, I think the sort of the complexity even in in in, in your in your patterns that you make. Um, I think we have a we have several questions. I know John Andrews had a question early on. Um, John, are you there? Okay. Um, all right, we'll come back to John. I know, Rosa, you had a question. Can we? Can um, I ask it? Yeah. Okay. Well, first of all, I'm a great fan and have been so for uh, 22 years. But the, the bottom line is, it's a mystery to me how you do it. I don't understand. Mm -hmm. it looks like you're working with straight rulers and uh, what, is it just drawing, cutting? How do you do this? You've, every uh one of these is, is like, Every, you know, each series is, is different. Like the graphite stuff is really drawing, um, using, I start with graphite sticks and I build it up into, you know, at the very end I'm using um, a hard pencil. Um, but mostly I don't, most of the time, I don't always use traditional tools. So some of it, like I said, I'm blowing ink and like the drawing breath series was blowing ink um, through tubes and I'm always working on the floor. So I'm chasing my drawing, my large pieces around the floor. Um, so I would, 
make marks on paper and then cut around those marks and then sometimes layer several pieces of paper depending on the piece. So that's a two part technique where I'm making, there's a making a mark and then there's cutting. Um, the more recent ones are, are layered where there's like an under layer of, um, some of them have an under layer of paint, not all of them. And then I'm using white ink on black paper or white ink on a dark background. Um, How many rulers do you use? <laughs> How many protractors, slide rules? A lot of it, you know, um, the current series, I do use rulers, but mostly it's free and, and there's a lot of like stuff. They look like when you see them on a small screen, they look really perfect, but um, they're not so perfect. When you see them in real life, there is very much uh, evidence of the hand. And I like to say like, you know, it's the um, evidence of the human making the mark as sort of um, a foil to a more dispassionate ideal of everything being perfect. And I also like that tension between things um, looking kind of controlled and perfect and then sort of seeing that they're much less controlled than you might think. <laughs> I'll ask one more question and then I'll stop. How did you get to this medium, this form of all the different you know, art forms available. How did this come evolve for you? Um, well, I used to be painter and painting on canvas and then life totally kicked my ass completely and I couldn't do um, painting for a time. And that's when I really got into working with paper. And it was also a time where I transitioned away from doing any work that had like, um, that was representational. Uh, and this was last century. And, um, and then I fell in love with paper and, and all the drawing materials and all of those materials that are sort of very conducive to working with paper. And that sort of just sent me on a, a path with that. I just uh, fell in love with it. Thank you. Thank you. And it's still a mystery <laughs> to me, by the way. That's, that's great. I think Tracy Higgins has a question as well. Tracy, did you want to ask? Yes. Uh, Tracy, uh, your voice is so deep. <laughs> vocal lessons. Uh, actually, Tracy is my lovely wife who's sitting behind me. Uh, uh, I have basically like three questions, but they're really one question. And that is, uh, what, what do you think about while you're working? Because I can imagine that the work is very focused and um, I, I sort of imagine your studio is very quiet and you're on the floor. I imagine your hand cramping up or whatever and you breathing. <laughs> am, I, am I correct in that? So what are you thinking? What's, what's going on? And uh, have you ever like been doing something and think to yourself like, what is this? What is this? And then all the, I saw Lin-Manuel talking the other night about, a, about the stuff that he's written. And then it took him a long while to realize like, oh, I, I'm, I'm writing about the loss of my friend when I was little. Uh, and it just sort of occurred to him now. So have, like, what are you thinking about? What's your body feel like? What's the studio like? And have you ever had some sort of like unconscious or subconscious thing come out and go like, oh my goodness, that's what that is. Um, to answer your first question, I think you should imagine my inner critic yelling and screaming at me <laughs> and the big arguments that go on between me and that really stinky, you know, inner critic while I'm working. That doesn't, that's not going on all the time, but that is definitely a presence in the studio. You need a jar for life, that. And in life. And, you know, um, somebody told me that um, doubt doubt is part of the creative process. Doubt, doubt. Um, and I agree with that. I think that that is really going on. So there's this doubt, there's me, you know, I'm just always sort of questioning of where is this going? What if that happens? What if, you know, what happens if I try this, you know? And I always think it's worth risking, um, wrecking the whole piece to try something because, um, you know, the chance of you want to make it really great. And if it's just sort of okay, or it's going along, you think, oh, this is pretty good. Like, that's okay, but that's not good enough. It's better to push it and risk risking, ri risk 
wrecking it. Um, the other thing, question you asked, I would say, absolutely, there are things that um, come out that surprise me. And I don't know, like a lot of, I've learned part of my process that I will start off and do, you know, maybe several works in a row and be going gangbusters with it. And then like, not I'll get freaked out or I won't know where to go with it next or whatever. And I have to set aside that body of work. And sometimes it gets set, set aside for years, like maybe even 10 years. And then there's a big, it's like, oh, I know, I know now, like, I'll just like, it comes back to me. So, so the, the progression is really kind of more of a spiral um, than a direct linear progression with the work. And, um, and it takes time to, to see, to understand, like sometimes these things that you're processing come out in a very immediate way. Um, and it takes time for you to really be able to um, figure, figure that stuff out and, and see that, oh, that's what I was processing when I was making this piece. So cool. It's, uh, yeah. So and my, my hands don't cramp so much, but since I work on the floor and I'm always bent over, you know, my, my, my back, <laughs> my back um, does a lot of work. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. That's a great, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, is Michelle Hunter here? She had a practical question at the very beginning. Um, I don't see her, I don't know if she's here, um, but her question was very practical. H how do you avoid smudging as you're working? Who says I avoid smudging? <laughs> <laughs> That's why these things are called anomaly. Like I try to be careful, you know, you can put a blotter piece or, or a, you know, a piece of blotter paper stuff under your hand, you can elevate, but, um, I don't worry too much about that. I'm not worried about it being perfect. If it's something that's really a problem, um, I can try and correct stuff, but I really rarely, rarely, rarely ever do that. This is the ordered irregularity that you sort of speak of, right? Yeah, I mean, there's these irregularities and it's also just like, this is part of the hand. Like I'm not, um, I'm okay with the traces of these being made by a very fallible, human <laughs> the traces of humanity right yeah yeah like it's a, it's a it's not a machine making these marks so if something smudges like you know that's okay to have that little trail that little trace or artifact of the making of it yeah no it's decidedly not i mean especially in a world now you know with sort of digital design and those kinds of things um you know this really does offer uh, um a, a a a sort of a counterpoint to that right the, the sort of the mark of the artist's hand um which i think is 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 so fascinating especially within um what some might consider that very ordered kind of digital world. I think that sort of unexpected experience of sort of looking up close and, and seeing those irregularities um, is so powerful in your work, right? Especially given, I think, um, you know, uh, um, what we might, might think we see, right? I think that that is sort of part of the process too, is um, that your work challenges the viewer in that way. We think we see something um, until we come up close, right? <laughs> and that's and that's that sort of intimacy that I was talking about before. That sort of inviting that kind of uh, dialogue and connection, you know, with the viewer, um, which again I think is is such a such a powerful aspect of your work. Um, I think uh, Joanna Joanna Castro is here. Hi, Joanna, um, and I think she has a question. Hello, everyone. Hi, media. Good, Good to, to be here. back home of sorts. <laughs> Hi, Sky. Hi, it's Joanna. great to see you. Um, it's you. great to just hear the conversation between the two of you and just the <laughs> ease and the fluidity that, that there is, even if we all are in our respective homes or somewhere else. Um, mine is, is, is like a, really a practical question. How do you choose your colors, what what inspires or what motivates you to say, uh, this is a color 
paper, this is the color, these are the shades I'm going to use for this particular piece. Um, I will say a lot of most almost all of my current work in the past years has is is black and white and gray and it's been that way for a while. I go through long, long periods of time, sometimes decade or more, without using any color. And um, that has, there's different reasons for that, but a lot of it has had to do with my uh, emotional state and my feelings about what, how the world is and whatever. And um, so the color goes out. And when it comes back, it usually comes back in a very big, old explosive <laughs> explosive way in some of the pieces like the the um passing through time being ones where that had those impossible shapes and stuff and some bright color a lot of those colors had to do the decisions about the color has to do um, a lot with perception and where they sit how colors react to each other um, a primal response to the color i think and where they sit in space and playing with the perception of like, you know, a yellow or a red really wants to jump forward in space. And sometimes you can mess with that and make it when somebody looks at it, it's like, oh, but it's behind everything else. How can it, how can the black be way in front of the red? Because the black usually recedes into space. And so you can use the colors and the tonalities of things to sort of present something and then turn it on its head and mess with people's minds in a nice way. Mess with people's minds in a nice way. <laughs> I hope that answers your question. I like that concept of messing with people in a nice way. <laughs> but, but yeah, I, I think um, I think Lilia had a question. Lilia, or did you have a comment? Lilia, did you want to jump in here? Hi. <laughs> Well, my question was answered by the answer to Rosa's question and somewhat to somewhat by the answer to Matt's question, who is Tracy's husband. Uh, hi, Matt. And uh, uh, I, I just, well, so I know it's not gouache, it's, it's, it's ink. I'm, I just, my comment is the way you use, the way you talk about your work, Sky, is uh, such a treat and it's so, deep but not self-involved it's like really really human and humane and uh i don't know it's it's just i'm looking forward to your show in september but listening to you commenting and talking about your work and your you know your ideas and everything is just great and i love the three emmas that are emissaries i mean what can be better thank you well thank you lily i loved seeing your your earlier Thursday here, and um, Thank you. Really, it's, it's wonderful. I, I really, really appreciate you saying that. Um, I just want to say, you know, when, when you get to see the work in person, Nira was talking about intimacy, and a lot of this work, because of the, the confines of my space and because of just the size that I am, they're a very human scale. So even the big pieces are about the size of a person. And I feel like when you get to be with them in person, it's so different than seeing them on the screen because they're like the size of you. And so they become much more enveloping um, when you can stand in front of them. And, and also you can come close and go far and you see different things. But that's part of my pitch to encourage you all to come to my show in September or come to my open studio next year and come and see me in person and say hello and 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 come and see the work and see Absolutely. how you feel when you um, get to see it with your own eyes. Yeah, and can you tell us sort of the, de the details of that show, your September show? Uh, the September show will be at June Kelly Gallery, which is um, down in Soho, 166 Mercer Street. Um, and the show is opening September 9th. It will run until October 12th. And um, because I'll have access to the gallery space in that time, I am looking forward to planning, hopefully some events, um, maybe an open discussion um, with some really interesting uh, people, a little panel discussion maybe in the, in the gallery or things that, that 
you know, the, the space is open, let's come, let's be there, let's do something together. That's wonderful. So September 9th, so we can all sort of make a note, right? Make uh, a note, and you know, if you're not on my mailing list and you would like to be on my mailing list, um, go to drop me a line um, and go to, you can reach me through my website, skypape.com, and I would be happy to send you updates about um, shows and events and stuff going on. And you will probably put it. <laughs> Sorry. Time for two more questions. Um, I think Nancy had a question. Nancy, are you here? Nancy? Yes. Do you want to ask your question? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. OK. I'm in the middle of nowhere in the country up in the Finger Lakes. Um, I, uh, I have been so mesmerized by your work. I think I noticed it uh, through Stephen Elcott, perhaps a few years ago. I don't know. Um, but I, um, I'm so curious about your name. Um, can you uh, share with us your, uh, the story behind your name? Um, there's no big story there. It's a family name. My mother's maiden name was uh, Sky, and that's that's the story there. <laughs> it's a they're great not, They're not hippies, you know. I I get asked that a lot. It's not. Um, <laughs> but uh, well, there you have it. It's great to know. No, I just love your name. Helps to, <laughs> helps to know the story. Helps to know the story. Thanks. Love your work. Sure. Thank you very much. That's uh, it, that's okay. Let's. I think we have one more question. Sandra is here. Sandra, can you? Uh, there you are. We're so happy to have you here. <laughs> I know. So you. nice to see you. Oh, it's so good to see you. <laughs> I'm so so many beautiful faces there, you know, that I haven't seen in a long time. <laughs> this is wonderful. So my my question, and I know you work, and I, how you doing, Sky? I'm I'm hanging in. It's so great to see you, Sandra. <laughs> great to see you too. And uh, I look at your work, and then I feel that I get, you know, like I want to go through all those, you know, spaces and through that door, that little door that you have in one of the painter, paintings and, mm -hmm. and go to the other side, you know, and it's, a, it's like, um, and I wonder, you know, like what, you know, it's almost like being cached in, 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 a, in a dream catcher, you know, it's like going through these dreams and so much poetry in it, you know, so much to, to talk about, you know, in the process of going to another dimension. And, and I look at it and I, and I, look at where we are right now in general, you know, uh, you know, as, as people, as humans, as uh, part of nature that sometimes we don't recognize. How do that connect, you know, how do you feel that connection with your work, you know, that, you know, how- Well, I feel like, you know, there's so many different ways that I'm coming at this, maybe I keep, you know, I use my work to, my work is a way that I connect to the world. And you know, I keep coming at the, up at this idea of connectivity. But to me, maybe in, in another way of looking at it is just, I mean, now I'm using systems and patterns, and you know, I think those help me um, examine relationships and cause and effect and stuff. But it's it's not just um, connectivity; it's also like entanglement, entanglement. Mm -hmm. Like it's there's cause and effect, but there's also really um, a very big and important idea. To, that I have in front of me is um, reciprocity. And you know, the, the first time I heard that word was uh, in history class as a kid and, and the Canadian American Reciprocity Treaty of 1854, the, dealing with trade. But um, reciprocity is so huge and it, it is on so many different levels, like when we look at the environment, when we look at our communities, when we look at everything um, about how we 
engage with everything in this with this idea of, of giving and you know what what's needed um, and I think that reciprocity comes into play with this other idea that is all about connectivity which is resilience and again that engage engages the idea of systems to me like thinking about when do our systems um, like our health system our political systems our societal systems our familial systems our our governmental systems you know um, it, when do they work and when do they fail you know what are the tolerance thresholds we have for uh, difference in within these systems you know like in our society especially you know we see that um, how much stress or corruption can these systems stand and you know how do our interconnections or how does reciprocity how do these things help repair systems you know um, if given half a chance you know um, so that that's you know to me is all kind of comes under this umbrella of connectivity and uh, I hope that that's something you know something that in some way comes in through the work but I think the work itself is just really an invitation to think to give yourself sort of some space to let your mind wander and when your mind has that that space then you can start to really engage with those ideas like when you're just like walking in the woods you know you're, you're not trying to solve a problem directly but when you have that space in your mind um, your mind is still thinking about things indirectly and I hope the work creates that kind of space for people and invitation for it. I think that's a that's a perfect way to sort of you know end um, this part uh, of the evening. The question of connectivity. I know for me, um, you know, I feel honored uh, uh, sort of being here with you, Sky. Also, with Sandra, our founding executive director at Noma, um, with Joanna Castro, who passed the baton um, to me. So you know, talk about sort of connections and and sort of um, you know having a space. For these conversations. I'm grateful to you for, for providing that um, for us. Um, and we have a little tradition here um, at Thursday Nights with Noma where we ask some rapid fire questions. Um, so I'm going to ask you a few questions, um, unscripted. Uh, these are Some of them are new. We haven't asked them before. Um, uh, <laughs> I'm going to try them out on you. I feel like you're right for it, right for the challenge. Um, and you know, just whatever's on your mind. So we'll we'll give it a go. All right. So here we here we we'll start. Um, describe yourself in three words. Um, resourceful, um, introverted, and. Um, creative, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I think we can we can all agree. <laughs> okay. Um, here's, here's one. I always find this kind of an interesting idea um, because it shapes so much of, of sort of the way we look at the world, I think, as adults. Um, what was your favorite book growing up? When I was a really little kid, um, when I was a little kid, I loved the story of Ferdinand the Bull. Um, who, you know, so Ferdinand made me a pacifist, and <laughs> Ferdinand is a bull, and they're trying to make him into a bull fighting bull, and all he wants to do is sit around and smell the flowers, and um, and then he gets stung by a bee and gets thrown in the bull fighting ring, and anyhow, he it's, it has a happy ending. But um, I loved Ferdinand the Bull. <laughs> I love Ferdinand too. I really do. It's such a such a great great story. It is amazing how e how we easily recall those books, right? That <laughs> it's just it's sort of just you know it's so yeah, accessible. They're, 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 you know. Yeah. I was, a big, there. <laughs> yeah, I was a big fan of the, the Big Orange Splot. You know, that was a book that I just was so drawn to as a kid. And I thought that was such a great story. Um, okay, here's another one. What are two things that you would put on your bucket list? Um, I think both of them, off, just off the top of my head, have to do with places I'd like to 
go. Um, one would be to Madagascar because of the wildlife there. Uh, and the other one off the top of my head would be um, seeing Japan um, because of my interest in paper and to really see if I could visit with some of those master paper makers and maybe um, do a little collaboration with them. Uh, that would be a dream come true. <laughs> oh, yeah, those, those, are, those are good. So, so maybe this is kind of connected to that. This is sort of a question we ask every time. Um, you're having a dinner party. You have three guests that you can invite, real, fictional, dead or alive. Who would you invite to this dinner party and what are you serving? What am I serving? Boy, um, <laughs> that's a tough question even for a regular dinner party. Um, if it were dead, dinner for the dead, I guess maybe um, Grandmaster Flash Ooh. and um, Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Okay. Uh, um, Rachel Carson, maybe throw her in the mix. That's and wow. If it were dinner for the living, I think I'd go for the younger living set, maybe like um, Greta Thunberg and Amanda Gorman and Malala, I think would be a really very fun. Uh, we could have a really good giggle fest at that. Party. Wow. That, <laughs> that, would, that would be a fun one. And That's I don't know what I what on earth I would serve. It would really, you know, you have to ask everybody their dietary restrictions. Are they gluten free? Are they, um, you know, dairy free? Are they vegan? <laughs> and then I would absolutely accommodate all of that. Well, I'd like to join either one of those dinner parties. And I <laughs> you're invited. Invited. You're right. invited. <laughs> okay, we have one last question. What is your favorite place uptown? Uh, hands down, Inwood Hill Park, where I am always there essentially every day, or any of our real like fabulous parks, Sherman Creek, Isham. Um, second place would be our New York Public Library. Ah, uh, yes, I would agree with both of those. Um, Sky, it's been such a pleasure and honor having you here tonight. Um, this has really been extraordinary. The hour absolutely flew. Um, and, and I think I speak for everyone um, when I say that, that truly this was um, sort of a, a, a treat for the intellect and the mind and the soul. So thank you so much uh, for being here. Thanks to all of you for being here tonight, um, for asking your questions and depositing your comments. And Sky, I hope you'll take a minute to read these comments um, that uh, uh, so many people have, have sort of registered in the chat um, and um, so many uh, admirers and so many interesting observations about your work. Thank you all for being here. It was a wonderful, wonderful um, evening. Uh, before we go, I would like to turn the mic over to Martin Collins, who will uh, make the final announcement of things to come. Martin, are you here? Yes, Daria, thank you everyone for joining us this evening on a truly wonderful Thursdays with Noma and Sky Pape. The Northern Manhattan Arts Alliance newsletter is your go-to resource for uptown events, exhibits, open studios, grant opportunities, and more for artists and arts organizations. Please visit our website, nomanyc.org, uh, to uh, get those details. Also, please visit our website, nomanyc.org, for a video congratulating this year's Uptown Art Stroll honorees, Warner Brothers Pictures in the Heights, 2020 Dykeman Muralist Collective, the Association of Dominican Classical Artists, Eric K. Washington and Elizabeth Starchevich. We invite you to take the Uptown Art Stroll survey, win prizes, give us your input by July 30th to win raffle prizes. Of course, we will continue after July 30th to accept uh, responses to this year's Uptown Art Stroll and it will help us in our planning process for the 20th Uptown Art Stroll coming up in 2022. Next week, the Northern Manhattan Arts Alliance opens the vault with a replay of True Titans, an eight-member Caribbean hip-hop band who played Thursdays with Noma last November. You can see True Titans 
only on NOMA's Facebook page next Thursday, July 15th at 7.30. The following Thursday, July 22nd at 7.30, we are live with George Nelson Preston, artist, art historian, and owner of one of the world's premier private art collections. Again, please see our website, nomanyc.org, for info on all of these events, our newsletter, and much, much more. Thank you all for joining us this evening on Thursdays with Noma and Sky Pape. Everyone, have a great weekend. Thank you, everybody.